How did I get from having a severe migraine to a CSF leak, which then caused brain sagging and intracranial hypotension? I do my best to explain it all along with all the technicalities. Before I begin, in my previous video, I explain in detail how my head pain started, what treatment I was given, and how I was diagnosed with status migranosis after my brain MRI didn't show anything significant other than the one line that kept bothering me, which I promised to speak about in this video, and I will, but towards the end. And that line is, and I'm going to quote that line again as I did in my previous video, mild pachymeningeal enhancement over the cerebral hemisphere is of unclear significance, end quote. If you would like to watch the video I'm speaking of first, then I'll link that above and in the description box below. Like I said, I'm going to go into details, so it's best I put time, time stamps in the description box for easier navigation of all the sections of this video. But if you skip through, then you may miss out on relevant inv information, but I leave that decision making up to you. So as usual, please remember that I am not a medical professional. I am a patient who is sharing her personal experience. Please consult a medical professional for your personal case. Now, continuing further, it was day 39. Yes, 39 days. <sighs> I was admitted to the hospital for the second time. My primary doctor was keen on me getting a lumbar puncture right away. And I was also, by then, mentally prepared for it, knowing that every other test had been done and this really was the only one left. But I was scared because as someone with Les danlos syndrome, local anesthesia doesn't work too well on me. So my preparation was not for what the results could be, but it was more for me to prepare myself to endure more pain than is usually expected out of a lumbar puncture. At some point, I will do a video about this whole EDS and local anesthesia issue, but for now, I carry on with this story. So what is a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap? Now, as the word suggests, a lumbar puncher is carried out in the lumbar region. A needle is inserted in the lumbar, which is the lower back, between two vertebrae to collect CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid is then tested for infections and possible medical issues and other conditions. So the pressure is also checked in this test. But to explain it better, healthline.com explains it better and I quote they'll likely position you on your side they'll clean your back with an antiseptic solution to reduce your risk of infection and numb it with a local anesthetic they'll inject a hollow needle in your subcornoid space to collect a sample of your CSF you may feel some pressure at this point but the procedure usually isn't painful after they remove the needle, they'll clean and bandage the puncture site." Unquote. Apologies for any mispronunciations there. Now, lum my lumbar puncher, number one. It was late evening. The anesthesiologist and a nurse, along with my primary doctor's assistant and the neurologist, came with their setup to carry out my lumbar puncher in my room. The nurse struggled to find a vein for my IV line. Another issue I should share someday soon. So, The anesthesiologist found one, thankfully. An awkward one, but it was one I was happy with. I warned him about my whole local anesthesia issue, but I got the feeling that he didn't quite believe me. Well, he tried to, so he gave me a double dose of local anesthesia in the first shot and proceeded to push in the lumbar puncher needle. I screamed multiple times. Clearly, it wasn't enough. I mean, the anesthesia wasn't enough. Over the course of the procedure, I had six times the usual amount given to usual patients having lumbar punctures. Um, just to give some context, 
medicinenet.com say, say, and I quote them, a lumbar puncture is usually not painful as a patient is first given a local anesthetic. Most patients feel nothing except for mild except for the mild sting of the local anesthetic needle. It is possible to feel a pressure sensation as the needle goes in. Unquote. I chuckle at such statements, but it seemed like this pain was the least of my issues. As I lay on my side, curled up, the lumbar puncture needle reached its destination, but the cerebrospinal fluid wasn't coming out. And then it trickled, but that too wasn't enough. I tried to relax, breathe slowly, and ask my body to just get through this as tears rolled down my face and in my ear. I was lying on my side, curled up, knees to my chest, hugging my legs. So I guess that's where the tear would go. It would go in my ear. Okay. Very unimportant information. The anesthesiologist suggested that we do this tomorrow with me sitting up in the hope that gravity will help the fluid come down better. But tomorrow, I didn't want to do this tomorrow. I wanted it over right away. So I suggested that if we could get the hospital bed I was on to move up a bit for it to incline, then it should help me sit up with that lumbar puncture needle still in my back. We did that and the flow improved, but still a collection of fluid that usually just takes 15 minutes took us 90 minutes. Yes, an hour and a half. That in itself told us something was wrong. The anesthesiologist and the neurologist discussed the need for a new brain MRI to be done. By then my back got patched up and I was given an ice pack for the soreness of my back, which took two weeks to go. My CSF was tested and it showed abnormal levels of protein. The range, was, the range should it usually is 15 to 45 mg slash DL and I was at 403.4. This alarmed the doctors and confirmed that there was definitely something wrong in the central nervous system. Day 40, my MRI brain number two. There was no way I could manage an MRI brain without being sedated, especially because my, of my claustrophobia issues and severe head pain and now this back soreness from the lumbar puncture. For that, I needed to be on a six hour fast after which I was sedated. The MRI was done and I was back in my room after being told that there were possible issues found, but we had to wait for the final report. Oh, for, for your information, I didn't all, I wasn't always claustrophobic in MRI machines. If interested, I've written about it in a blog post, which I'll link in the description box. Day 41. The final report was now in and boy did it look very different from my MRI that was done on day five so day five now day 41 here's what it said and I'm gonna quote apologies in advance for the pronunciations but I think sharing it might help thin bilateral subdural collections and thick pachymeningeal enhancement over the cerebral and cerebrular hemispheres, flax, tentori tentorium, exaggerated enhancement is also present along the clivus with, di clivus with distentation and convexity of transverse sinuses. In the spine, there is prominence of the posterior epidural space and veins with enhancement. Thin epidural fluid collection is noted in the cervical spine along the lateral margins of the coal sac, the coal sac Imaging findings are suggestive of intracranial hypotension. Mild bilateral uncal herniation without mass effect on the brainstem or effacement of basal cisterns. Pachymeningeal enhancement has increased since the previous MRI study dated 19th March 2021 with the collections being new findings. Phew. Again, apologies for those pronunciations. Now, once this was out, my primary doctor, neurologist and a neurosurgeon came to meet me. All of them, in their own way, explained there is a possible cerebrospinal fluid leak, which has caused the brain to 
drop or to put it nicely the brain has sagged causing swelling and pain which is known as intracranial hypotension they now wanted to identify where the leak was and guess what i needed a new lumbar puncture for that but before i get on to the whys and hows of it what is intracranial hypotension i'm not qualified to explain this properly but from what i was told by my doctors this explanation from columbiaspine.org fits the best and i quote spontaneous intracranial hypertension is a condition in which the fluid pressure inside the skull is lower than normal the brain and spinal cord are covered by a tough watertight membrane called the dura inside the dura is the cerebrospinal fluid csf a liquid that bathes and cushions the brain and spinal cord normally the csf circulates inside the dura gradually drains and is constantly replenished with new fluid but a leak in the dura can allow too much csf to escape too quickly this reduces the amount of csf in circulation reducing the fluid pressure and causing intracranial hypotension unquote day 43 The previous day was a Sunday, so the second lumbar puncture had to wait for this day. Plus it gave my previous lumbar puncture pain an extra day to heal. Not that it made much of a difference actually. But this was my worst nightmare coming true. Another lumbar puncture in the same area with the local anesthetic not working for me, but what added to my woes was for this lumbar puncture I had to be fasting as well. Please remember I am still having horrendous headaches. I can't sit up properly without feeling like my neck is going to snap and now I have a lumbar puncture soreness as well. Oh and like I said I'm fasting. Hunger equals more head pain. Now on to lumbar puncture number 2 with a CT scan. So that was the point of another lumbar puncture. I'll explain. So this lumbar puncture was different yet similar to the first one. what was similar i would be in the same position as the first one the local anesthetic wasn't going to work so i would need more than usual the anesthesiologist would draw out some csf to make sure she had got the right area and i was going to scream in pain what was going to be different i was fasting because this time the anesthesiologist needed to inject a contrast dye after she made sure she had reached the csf they were going to put me in a trendelenburg trendelenburg position which is the head down tilt position for 30 minutes to make sure the contrast dye gets to the brain after which a ct scan would be done in the hope the dye would leak out somewhere and the imaging would catch it and that's how it all went i'll spare you the details of my screaming and how ugly painful it was it was really bad but i was happy to finally be back in my room eating i was so missing food okay the important day day 44 it was the decision making day my lumbar puncture ct scan results were in and here's what the report said anterior epidural extravasation of contrast in the cervical spine which is maximum at C6 C7 levels with extension laterally along the neural foramina para para vertebral soft tissue there are posterior osteophyte discs complex at C6 C7 levels indenting the col sac circumferential epidural extravasation of contrast is present in the thoracic spine with calcification of the posterior annulus at T4 5 and T10 11 the exact site of CSF leak is unclear in view of long segment of extravasation but appears to be at C6 C7 T1 levels in view of maximum concentration of anterior localization of contrast with presence of posterior osteophytes unquote Bright and prompt my neurosurgeon walked into my room and in his big booming voice explained these findings. 
They appeared there there appeared to be a bone spur in my cervical region six, C6 C7 which was protruding and had possibly caused a tear in the dura. The dura is the outermost of the three layers of the membrane called the meninges that protect the central nervous system. So that was a quote. Um, so this seemed to be the most likely site of, my, of the CSF leak, the reason for my intracranial hypotension. The surgeon now gave me two options, one conservative, but tried and tested and the other invasive. So I'll explain both the options I was given. Option one was the conservative one. The epidural blood patch is the standard and surgical procedure done to plug a CSF leak. Under general anesthetic, fresh blood would be drawn from my arm and using an epidural needle and with the guidance of an x-ray machine, the blood would be injected at the region where the leak is suspected. The blood then travels to the leak, begins to clot and patches the hole. This then helps the dura to heal. Once the surgery is over, I would again be kept in the Trendelenburg, Trendelenburg ugh, position, which is head down tilt for 30 minutes before I come out of anesthesia and be taken to the recovery room. The first month of recovery would be strict bed rest and then my symptoms would tell us how it's all going. Option two, which was the invasive one, um, a cut would be made from the front of my throat going past the voice box. The surgeon would get to the cervical bone spur, shave it and patch the exact location of the leak. This patch would be accurate rather than injecting blood in the hope that the blood clots and patches at the right place as in the case with option one. So the risks are plenty with this type of surgery plus a much, much, much longer recovery time. Although the, although the decision was left to me, all three of my doctors believed that we must try the conservative approach first. And if it doesn't work, and which we would know based on how I feel in the months ahead, then we would look at option number two. Option one, which was a conservative one, came with a 70% success rate, which I was reassured was very high. So I guess it was option number one then. The doctors didn't want to waste any time. They wanted the surgery done the very next day. I didn't understand the seriousness of it until much later. Day 45, surgery day. At 4.45 a.m. I had breakfast and went back to sleep. I needed at least seven hours fasting and with my surgery scheduled for noon time, I had to have such an early breakfast which really felt more like a midnight snack. But anyways, at 10 a.m. I was asked to apply um, some sanitizing liquid at the end of my bath. These were peak COVID times in Mumbai that I was dealing with, with its second wave so um, the amount of precautions we took were loads. By noon, I was at the pre-surgery waiting area, which doubles up as the recovery room post-surgery. This is when my IV line came out and um, the anesthesiologist who chose not to believe me um, uh, wanted to put a new IV line in my hand and that's where my veins well, because that's where my veins were most obviously visible to him because of the thin EDS skin. But it doesn't help because it doesn't help me because my skin reacts very fast. The skin on my hands are super sensitive. It cannot take an IV line, but he did it anyway, which I'm still not very happy about. So I was taken into the operating room. I saw the huge TV screen, the screen that will guide them with where to inject the blood. I felt calm about it. We were getting closer to fixing my pain. As the general anesthetic was injected, I screamed because the IV line still hurt, but I passed out within seconds. I woke up post-surgery and post the 30 minutes of the head down tilt, screaming, just I had done so while I was passing out. Um, why I was screaming? Did the neck hurt so much? Frankly, the neck pain was the second most painful thing in that moment. The first was that IV line. Trust me, it killed. I was also cold. I shivered away as a warm air pipe was placed under my blanket. 
This is when I suddenly realized that I now face a new challenge, the challenge of getting better. The first night I struggled more than I had in any of the three previous surgeries I had had in my life. This is also when I realized that surgery related to the central nervous system, especially when your main issue was felt in the head, was no joke. The volatility of the area and the importance of following instructions was so, so, so important. I had to lie flat, no left, no right and no pillow. To stop myself from turning, I kept pillows on either side of my head. But here's where it went wrong. I needed to take my oral medication. For that, the nurse inclined the bed a bit so that I could swallow and drink. I had moved my head off like the, off the bed just a milliliter to put like the medicine in my mouth and that's when the worst pain ever struck. I screamed and cried and felt like my whole neck and head was being electrocuted. I thought I was done. I had no strength in me but I had to calm the pain. But it continued and so I continued to scream and cry. It took extra painkillers and 45 minutes for this episode to settle and one second for me to learn my lesson. No moving the head at all. That night, I also went through a panic attack. The fact that I couldn't move, I could not turn left or right, it was dark, all made me feel suffocated and trapped. This is where the nurse and a friend of mine helped me through. They got the lights on and got me a wet towel like I'd asked for so that I could breathe into something that made me feel like I was getting fresh air. I didn't really have a lot of days when I could step out. I mean, during these 45 days, I didn't really step out for fresh air. And here I was on the 15th floor of the hospital where the windows don't open for obvious reasons. Thankfully, I eventually settled and slept. Day 46. My neurosurgeon came to check up on me the next morning. He gave me confidence that the surgery went well and that I now need to follow the instructions and be positive. Thankfully, I was allowed to turn to the left and the right, but not turn my head. Instead, turn the whole body left or right. It's called a log roll. I was expected to have a high intake of fluids as I had been doing my entire time but peeing had to be done in a bedpan for the first few days post-surgery. Day 47, days 47 to 49. I spent the next three, next three days recovering to the point that I could make it to the bathroom and back. It was tough because four things weren't allowed. Bending, lifting, twisting and straining, B-L-T-S. But I had to avoid them if I was to feel better. I was happy to be going home, finally. Home to mum, my puppy, and very importantly, my bed. Before I left, my primary doctor came to see me. Now that the situation was better and we were both more relaxed, I asked her for her honest opinion of whether I dodged a bullet and how bad did my situation actually get. She was upfront enough to tell me that I got very close to things getting ugly. If I, had, if I had gotten admitted even two days later, my brain would have been close to putting me in a coma. Was I surprised? I wasn't, because I knew how bad I felt and by then I had read enough about my situation. But yes, it did scare me, it did tear me up, but I felt extremely grateful that my doctors were brilliant and I had all the support and the best facilities and minds available to me. And like I said earlier, it was during a time when Mumbai was struggling with its second wave of COVID-19. She left me giving the one piece of crucial advice that I had heard every single day that I was in hospital. Drink two to three liters of water every day. The brain needs fluids for it to float again and I desperately needed that replenishment. I end now with an important question. 
could the doctors have prevented my situation from getting so bad? Possibly, yes. I go back to my first brain MRI done on day five, back to that one sentence that stayed with me. Mild pachymeningeal enhancement over the cerebral hemispheres is of unclear significance. If we look up mild pachymeningeal enhancement, you get information from radiopedia.org, which says, and I quote, pachymeningeal enhancement, also known as dura arachnoid enhancement for refers to a dural and outer layer of arachnoid pattern of enhancement seen following contrast administration and may occur in the conditions listed below. Infectional intracranial tumor metastasis, uh, intracranial hypotension, post-operative states, idiopathic pachymeningitis, etc., etc., cerebral venous thrombosis, neurosarcoidosis, extramedullary hematopoiesis, rheumatoid arthritis, granulomatosis with polyangitis, unquote. Again, I really messed up those names, haven't I? When I had read this 15 days into my migraine, the word intercran intracranial hypertension caught my eye simply because I have POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which can cause my blood pressure to drop, which then linked the word hypotension. It linked with the word hypotension. So this was me possibly overthinking, but I was desperately looking for answers for my never ending migraine. I clicked on intracranial hypertension, believing it'll just lead to another dead end. Here's what showed up, and I quote again from radiopedia.org. Intracranial hypertension, also known as craniospinal hypertension, is defined as cerebrospinal flu fluid, CSF pressure, less than 6 cm H2O in patients with clinical presentation compatible with intracranial hypertension, namely postural headache, nausea, vomiting, neck pain, visual and hearing disturbances, and vertigo. It most commonly results from a CSF leak somewhere along the neuraxis. It is also more commonly seen in connective tissue disorders, including Marfan syndrome, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease (ADPKD). Unquote. There it was. Ellis Danlos syndrome, finding me here too. And later, when I got to know that a bone spur caused the tear for there to be a leak, I was told a bone spur is common with those who have EDS. So yes, a simple Google search told me so much, but there wasn't enough evidence clinically for the doctors, for the doctors early on. Now, to be fair, I was offered a lumbar puncture in the first time I was admitted, but fearing the pain and my MRI being pretty normal, it wasn't insisted upon and I completely agreed with how the doctors went about everything. In that sense, no complaints. But yes, in theory, I could have suffered less. It didn't have to get this close. What worked for me was advocating for myself and having good doctors. We were all persistent and curious. We were working as a team to help me. Again, I could not have gotten through this without my family, friends, and knowing that my pup, Toby, misses me and that I needed to get home for all of them. I just want to end by saying, I hope that my story helps someone out there. Please also share my story to anyone you think needs it, anyone you think is suffering from unexplainable head pain. And please like and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for your support. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you so much.